Aloha Owina La, I'm Kaui Lucas. This is Hawaii is my mainland. Last Friday, I was privileged to be able to attend a symposium on the sharing economy at UH Law School's um, The Law Review. And uh, one of the keynote speaker there was a, the assistant professor of law at Whittier College, Erez Alani, and his um, keynote speech was really compelling. It speaks to something that I can't go a day in Honolulu without having come up in conversation, and that is the pressure around housing, and specifically with the sharing economy, the effect of Airbnb. So he is no longer in Hawaii, unfortunately, but he's joining us today via Skype from California. Welcome, Professor Aloni. Aloha. Thank you so much for having me on your show. So um, it was great to have the, the symposium on this subject uh, here. We had some, um, even the um, uh, Supreme Court Justice Sabrina McKenna was there. It was very well attended and um, I learned a lot. I, I suppose you maybe didn't learn too much because you were the keynote speaker, but it is an important new topic in law. And I'm grateful that you're so articulate and able to speak uh, in a way that even those of us who are not attorneys can understand. So let's jump into this. Now, um, Professor Aloni, how, how big is this problem? Wh what are we looking at? You know, um, uh, we are talking about a major, major issue, and let me just uh, kind of give, um, explain where we are on this issue, and that is, we are talking about a very particular topic within this bigger topic of the on-demand eco on -demand economy, right? We have a bigger issue as related to other subjects which we are not going to talk about much today as transportation and other services. Um, not only housing, right, uh, but, uh, but particularly focusing on the housing issue, we are talking about something that is really big. So just in order to get the numbers, just a little bit of them. In 2015, um, Airbnb facilitated um, 155 million visits, uh, which is 22% more than Hilton worldwide. Right, we are talking about a company, Airbnb, that is worth, um, that is valued now at thirty billion dollar. So that's how big um, of an issue we're dealing with. But remember, it's 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 a tiny part of this um, issue of the uh, on-demand economy. Notice that I'm not using the term sharing economy as you did. No, and I was very grateful. I mean, right off the bat, you gave an example, which I'd like you to give, um, which is a great way I've been able to use it in conversations this past week all over the place. Um, explain what the difference is, why you don't like that term. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's not that I don't like. I think it's completely inaccurate, and I think it, it, uh, it doesn't do service to really recognize what is at stake, right? When I talk about sharing something, I'm sharing something, I'm sharing an apartment with my partner. When my mother comes, we share a room with her, right? So sharing has a, an altruistic motive, um, a, a, a altruistic uh, underlying feeling. But here we're talking about um, transactions, transactions that are self-motivated for pursuit of money, by the facilitator, that is Airbnb, by the consumer, and they, then by the provider. And when we use the term sharing, we convey some kind of altruistic slash community um, uh, uh, motive that doesn't really exist, but is really helpful when we talk with legislature or with other people, right? To convince them, yes, it's sharing, it's nice, it's communal, it's environmental. Yeah, it's what it's what we all want deep down. It's got that warm fuzzy thing built into it historically. But you gave that example of what's the difference between um, access and excess, and I thought that was very helpful. 
So, 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 so I think that one of the main thing that we need to understand, and this is my opinion, I think it's one of the underlying issues and one of the more, most important issues to understand, is what we call the on-demand economy actually contains two different types of transactions. I think one of them is more positive and one of them has more negative externalities. One of them is when people use their underutilized goods, right? When I go abroad to Israel twice a year and I need someone who will take care of my cat, I use Airbnb to find someone who will use the apartment while, I go, while I'm gone, right? I'm not uh, operating a hotel. I'm, 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 I'm using this dead capital in order to make some more money to help me pay the income and that someone will take care of the cat, right? Um, and at this, but let's distinguish that from many people who use Airbnb and other platforms in a completely different way. And that is people who um, use it for operating a hotel like or bed, on bed, bed and breakfast. I called this kind of distinction people who um, use their increased ex excess capacity that is using their underutilized goods, right? Using same infrastructures that they already have versus those professionals players who either convert um, convert properties that are currently on the long-term rental and use them for the short-term rental or just buy more and more properties to operate hotels like. We call out that the on-demand economy because they all use Airbnb, but these are very different things, so, I think. <clears throat> and you have some you have some numbers that are uh, that are helpful in in illustrating that. Um, perhaps we uh, okay. So we're looking right now at the um, multiple unit operators. Right. Um, so so um, uh, so what you see in this slide, if I'm talking about um, the same slide as you do, um, is um, a research just conducted by, uh, by um, uh, Penn State University. And it shows you how much of the revenue um, of Airbnb comes from those who are full-time operator. That is, people who have more than one unit or that have units that are more than 360 days a year offered for rent, right? So those are who essentially do commercial use of Airbnb. And look at the data, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Um, there is 40% of Airbnb revenue in 14, in 14 cities arrive from people who have more two units or more. 40%, okay, it's not little. Um, and you can see also that 26% um, of the people who have 300, who have their units um, for 360 days or more, um, um, uh, people who rent their properties for 360 days or more, um, essentially give Airbnb 26% of its revenue in 14 major cities. Okay, so you so see that this distinction that I talk about exists. Uh, do you happen to know if those 14 cities are in the United States? Or, or uh, is that global? Uh, no, they, they just selected 14 major cities in order to understand. So it's Boston, Philadelphia, etc. Okay, so um, it's the United and States. Examining the data in these 14 cities um, showed them how many people are actually professional players, full-time operators, and that really generate a substantial amount of Airbnb revenue. So if Airbnb tells you, no, these are only private people who work in excess capacity or you know, when they go on vacation, you see, yeah. that's not the entire story, right? Right, right, definitely not. You want to see the situation in Hawaii? Yes. Because it's very interesting in Hawaii. So if we can see for a moment the slide in Hawaii, we will see the same thing, this distinction between those who operate full-time and those who operate just in excess capacity, just in increased excess capacity. So if you look at the start, what the slide shows um, is how many hosts, active hosts on Airbnb existed in Honolulu in February 2017. And what you see there is that there are a total of 1,519 active hosts. 1,000 of them indeed have one unit, right? The same thing as I likely um, just people who use their own residency while they are away and try to capitalize 
um, on their dead capital. But then you see that there are 238 with, uh, hosts with two units. And look at the end, right at the right side of yeah. the slide. There you already have 117 hosts that have five units or more. Right? These are people who work professionally um, and just use Airbnb to operate unlicensed uh, bread, bed and breakfast. And, and although we're talking a lot about um, Airbnb, um, we know that um, this is just one of the players. Like Monsanto gets all, all the headlines, but we know there's, there, there are a lot of chemical companies. And Airbnb gets all the headlines, but we know there's, there's other companies. So in, in, in just in Hawaii, you just gave us an example, a third just with Airbnb are professional. That's that's pretty staggering, and you brought you brought some some other numbers into um, the play. Um, uh, which um, I uh, when you sent me this, I was really shocked. Um, when you see how um, Airbnb is promoting it, um, residential property as investment property in the United States, the best places to buy. Airbnb investment property. Now they're not talking about hotels, right? They're talking about homes. No, to be clear, it's not Airbnb. It's a it's a company. It's a different company, right? Airb um, Air DNA, which is uh, which shows you how common now this phenomenon is that there are websites that advise people where they should buy property and convert it um, to Airbnb to short term rentals. Where it, it, it's just a phenomenon that people now just live from the money of being professional hosts. But notice the very interesting thing you are most you will be most interested in that. So there is a slight. So one thing that you under, that you need to understand that it's important for everybody to understand is why why so many people have a strong incentive to take off um, long term rentals to take them off from the regular long term market and convert them to short-term market. And um, you'll see in a moment that in, in Hawaii particularly, the incentive is so, so, so big. So if you see there, there is a slide um, with a graph um, that on the one, uh, of, on one side um, has, um, on, the, on the one side it has um, uh, the, um, uh, the average, sorry, on one side you have the average monthly rent in a particular sen sen uh, city, and on the other um, you have the average revenue that an Airbnb host can make. Do you, do you have this slide now in front of you? I mean, it has many cities in this slide. I mean, it shows you which cities eventually are most profitable to convert short, uh, long-term rental to short-term term rental. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not seeing that one, actually. Um, so it, it, it is the one with the many, many cities, with the number, with, with the names of the many cities across. I'm 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 sorry, Professor Aloni. I okay, I'm, don't worry about it. So let me tell you what it okay, what, what tell, it tells you. Tell us what we need to know. <laughs> don't worry about it. That, that, it's 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 easy to explain that. It's it, what, what it essentially show. Uh, what, what essentially I'm trying to say is the following: in Honolulu, Hawaii, the average rental cost of one bedroom um, in a long-term rental is thirteen hundred, but the average revenue for an Airbnb host, the average, is 2,800. Okay, 1,300 if your apartment is in the long-term rental. 2,800, more than double, if you are uh, converting it to a short rental. Um, if you are a superstar Airbnb host, that is in the 19th, 19th, uh, 19th uh, percentile, then you will have more than 4,500 4, 4, a month. Okay, the 90th percentile would be in the 90th percentile of what? 
of uh, best hosts in the area. So you really know how to promote your property, you know how to get good reviews, mm -hmm. you will be able to rent for more and more days. That will mean that your the average typically is 2,800, so you will be able to make 4,500 a month. So an apartment that's on the long-term rental is 1,300. And I think that explains it all really explains why and notice so uh, the two one of the two in the entire u.s two of the cities that are really most profitable to convert short long term to short term are honolulu and uh, um and um california looks like and um the other um okay. the other hawaii uh city that oh, i don't remember Kailua. its name in a Kailua. moment yes yes so, um, Professor Alani, we're going to break for a minute and then come back and talk more about this. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people are collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Hello. My name is Crystal. Let me tell you, my talk show, I'm all about health. It's healthy to talk about sex. It's healthy to talk about things that people don't talk about. It's healthy to discuss things that you think are unhealthy because you need to talk about it. So I welcome you to watch Quok Talk and engage in some provocative discussions on things that do relate to healthy issues and have a well-balanced attitude in life. Join me. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. Today I have um, via Skype, Professor Erez Alani from Whittier College in California, who was recently in Honolulu for the Sharing Economy Symposium at UH's Richardson Law School. Thank you, yeah. Professor Alani. So oh, what happened to the light here? Um, I'm sorry. We, there, uh, there is some. We, we the the natural ahead. light ends um, at some point. Sorry. OK, so we rolled up our sleeves and got into some numbers. Let's keep going. Um, we, um, you have some other statistics here, um, not about Hawaii. Um, so let's look at those for a minute about about Vancouver, and let's let's talk about some of the things that are being done in other places to sort of relieve the pressure. Sure. So look, the, the, what I just described in Hawaii, and that is that there is an incentive to convert long term to uh, long term to short term, is really true everywhere. Um, or in many other cities in the U.S. and that creates a problem and the problem is um, housing shortage um, and we already see sh um, the way that Airbnb and other similar uh, platforms contribute to the housing to the housing shortage in many other places um, so uh, what do we do about it um, I think that currently there are in a very rough way um, three different categories of responses. One kind of response is what Berlin in Germany did, and that is let's completely ban short-term rentals, right? Let's just don't have short-term rentals of entire units forever. Wow. And I'll tell you why. I think that there is a virtue when people do what I do, right? When I use it twice, twice a year, when I'm on vacation, when people use their excess capacity, right? When they increase their excess capacity. Right. I think it's good for, especially with places like Berlin, Hawaii, and everywhere in which um, housing prices are skyrocketing, people can help them to pay the mortgage if they every once in a while do this kind of sublet. So I do not support a Berlin type of um, solution. But Vancouver, BC, however, um, has recently proposed something that I th find very interesting and more balanced, and that really distinguished between those who are just professional workers um, to those who work in excess uh, capacity. So in order to know a little bit what's going on in Vancouver, it's interesting to know that, that Vancouver experiences a serious shortage in housing. Um, House, house prices there has been skyrocketed. Um, it has been ranked as the three least affordable uh, 
a city in the world in terms of housing, etc. Wow, that's significant. Um, but and, and what you so so and, and and of course, of course, blaming Airbnb or short-term rental is the wrong answer, right? There are many other factors that are relevant to why there are housing um, shortage, but. If you look at Airbnb in Hawaii, in, in, in Vancouver, you'll see the same thing that we see in Hawaii. And that is, if you look at the slide in Vancouver there for, uh, for just a moment, you'll see the same thing that we saw um, in Hawaii. And that is, there are um, some people who just um, rent their apartment for a few days a year. Some people do it, as you can see, for more than nine months uh, a year. So. Currently in Vancouver, all 97% er of Airbnbs are illegal in Vancouver at the moment because it's yep yeah, because it's illegal there um, to rent for less than 30 days. Okay. But uh, the new uh, no, uh, the new suggestions to how to handle that a bill that is currently pending is to limit. Um, the ability to do short-term rentals only to people who are principal residents. Well, that sure has my vote. So they're looking at that in Vancouver. Right. Okay. Um, that is currently a bill that is pending. Okay. And it should be, notice it, it, it should be very simple, right? It can be online application. You should get a license. You should apply for a license. But it's a very it's very quick. It's it's forty dollars I think going to cost. It's inexpensive, very easy. Recognizing that these are simple people who do you know who are just micro earners, right? At the same time, what you need to prove is that you're the principal resident, right? So um, and the assumption is that principal residents don't don't create don't use their own home for hotel like operations. Um, so that's the situation in Vancouver, and what would be the result? Estimating that 1,000 units will go back to the rental market in Vancouver. Vancouver rental market is horrendous, and 1,000 units that are currently used for condos, for investments, and etc., back in the market would be very, very helpful. Well, thanks to you, I did some research, uh, well, actually came into my inbox uh, serendipitously <laughs> yesterday, on on this the idea of uh, those those empty units or how 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 what is the volume that we're talking about for Honolulu, and we have a um, another um, slide on that housing inventory specific to to Hawaii and um, so um, total housing units um, if you look down to units not available long term vacancies vacant for seasonal use. 11,000, wow, that's on Hawaii Island, even more than, I mean, when you, uh, percentage-wise, way more uh, than, than Oahu, but that's still 10,000 units that would, would make a huge difference here. This is a huge problem everywhere, but not everywhere. In particular, destinations like Hawaii, in which are very favored on some uh, for some population as having you know summer homes or investment homes. And so you need to do two things. I think you know I, I think that there are two things that you could do. Or that there are two things that that Vancouver is currently doing. One is um, make sure that these um, housing are not used for short-term rentals. But another problem is um, just how to avoid these, you know, ghost towns, right? These, these places where you have all these vacancies yes. that are essentially empty. What Vancouver did, which I think is um, extremely innovative, and perhaps in the U.S. In, is unthinkable, and that is imposing 15% tax on foreigners, that is people who are not Canadian citizens or do not have lawful residency, who buy properties in metro in, in Vancouver metro? So additional 15% tax. So think about it as follows: If you're buying a home for three million dollars, you'll pay additional two hundred thousand dollars. And you know what was the result? What? The result was um, a significant. Well, that came into that took effect in August 2016. We're talking about a very new thing. Very new. But the result is very, very clear that the prices are very clearly trending down, um, 
uh, downward now um, in Vancouver for the first time in one of the hottest and craziest uh, housing markets in the world. In fact, um, one statistic, and I'm, I'm not going to, well, uh, one statistic and take it with a grain of salt, but here is one statistic, and that is um, as follows. Before this tax in 2016, foreign buyers accounted for 13% of the residential purchases one, in the three, region. They accounted and for now, foreign, buy, bu foreign buyers, I'm sorry, were 1, 3%, 13%? 13, 1, 3% okay. uh, before the tax, down to 1.2 or 1.3% after the tax of foreign capital uh, buying uh, housing in Vancouver. Again, controversial, new, Innovative, perhaps unthinkable in the U.S., but notice how these two supplement one another, right? One is handling all this vacancy. Um, what about the next county over? I don't know how the geography works in, in Canada, but okay, it's going to cost me $200,000 more if I buy a house in Vancouver, so what's next door? Um, is, is, that, is that sort of a thing happening? Oh, or? it's not a thing because Vancouver is a very, very attractive city. There are, there are very few um, uh, uh, places that are as Vancouver. It has a mild winter relatively. It is very, very, very friendly to foreigners um, of all kinds. Um, you know how they treat their immigrants as... There isn't an uh, immigration ban in Vancouver, let me tell you. They actually call the immigrants their new Canadian, right? I mean, oh, they have sweet. great schools and best air pollution, etc. Now, we have little time, right? So maybe just let me tell you now an, an, on another approach. Sure. And that is in San Francisco. Um, San Francisco took a relatively similar approach, but it's based on number of days. So there is a limitation on the number of days in which a tenant or owner can, can do short terms. Um, so um, we are talking about um, um, owner or tenant cannot rent for more than 90 days a year. In addition, they need a license. And in addition, they need, uh, they need a few types of licenses. Okay, well, we, we are going to have to sign off here very quickly. Thank you. This is a, a dense subject, and you have given us a lot of, of ammunition uh, for working on our, our problems here. And something tells me this won't be the last time you and I have a discussion about it. Thank I you really so much, it. Professor Aloni. Aloha.